you got to see the the uh, the program that we just did, uh, uh, where Jack recalls some of the the famous moments that he participated in in Major League Baseball history, and uh, and joining us tonight, longtime uh, Baltimore baseball reporter um, and uh, still working for Press Box, doing great work, Jim Henneman. Uh, and and Jim was a, a, a very young man, uh, you know, covering the Orioles back when Jack was a very young man, um, you know, pitching for the Orioles. And uh, so we're going to get into all of that. But thank you all for tuning in this evening. And uh, I expect this is going to be a, a great cap off to uh, our birthday bash programming. So thank you, gentlemen. And, um, you know, I want to, you know, Jack, we've just been watching you. Uh, so let me uh, ask Jim. When you were, uh, you know, in 1960, we're, we're watching the Orioles kind of congeal and become uh, uh, the foundation for what became the the, uh, the golden age of Orioles baseball with all the all the great uh, pennant winners we had uh, over the next 20 some years. But uh, did you know something special was happening under Paul Richards with the Kitty Corps uh, in 1960 and uh, and Jack Fisher? Well, Mike, I'll tell you, uh, the funny thing for me is that 1960 was actually my my rookie year. So uh, I was a little bit older than Jack, but he had a couple of years experience on me already. But uh, yeah, one of my one of my great memories of, of that time, uh, and, and it all started with the Kitty Corps, and uh, and Jack was was at the forefront. I mean, he, very limited time in the minor leagues, and uh, just it was that was just a really really fun year that uh, that kind of came out of nowhere. Jack was, you were around a little bit in 59 too. I think we, we kind of got a, an idea in 59, but we didn't really know quite what was in store for 1960. And that kind of put everything in motion, I think, from, from, from that time on for the Oriole Way. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the Oriole Way uh, attributed to, to tall Paul Richards, for sure. Uh, you know, that, that, that is for sure. Jack, you had come up in, in 59, and um, uh, so you're there for a year, and as you go into 1960, you, you, still, ha you still have, uh, you've got guys like Brooks Robinson coming coming along, and you've got, a, you know, Big Gus Triandos is still with you, and you've got the Kitty Corps. Uh, did you guys, at the beginning of the 1960 season, think that you had a chance to, to compete and contend? I, I really don't know the thing we we had any thought about it is I think uh, what we all thought is that every game we went out there, we were going to be competitive because we felt we could hold the other team down. I mean, we, uh, we had some fairly good arms on the mound and we had a, a really good defense. And uh, the, the only question was, could we score enough runs? But uh, uh, the way the season went along, uh, yeah, it got very interesting. We were, we were really high then. You, you, you were, and, and as we talked about in the uh, the piece that was uh, previously on, um, when you get, you know, the Orioles are, are not only competitive, but they're challenging for first place or tied for first place as we go into September. And, uh, you know, I, I was a 13-year-old uh, with a huge uh, Orioles fan for a father who took me to, um, all three games of that New York series in Baltimore, and then to two games in New York <laughs> later on. But uh, this town was crazy. Jim, um, uh, you know, what was your sense of, of Baltimore's uh, reaction to the Orioles becoming a contender in 1960? Well, you got to remember, we you know, the team had only been there for really six years. And uh, I think that that was part of their thing. We came here as a firm a uh, rather firm last place team. And so it was, it, it took a while. And I, so I just think that, that I, I really do think that 59 was a little bit of a jump start. Uh, you know, not that we expected 60 to be what it was, but um, I know myself as, as a youngster, uh, when, when Bill, and I look back at 1960 again as, as a catalyst to everything, but, but for me, uh, as a as a teenager, uh, you know, I never really got past. I mean, the my euphoria was really in 1954 when I saw my my first major league game in Baltimore, and so, you know, I, that even to this day still resonates with me. So, uh, 
uh, I look at 54 and then I look at 60 and then I look at 66. Those are like my three years. That, uh, yeah, they, they were big. They, they certainly were big years. Um, and, and Jack, um, and I'm going to turn this over to you, Katie, in a second to let the audience participate. But um, a lot of people really uh, attribute the Orioles' early success uh, to Paul Richards and the and uh, the, and his establishing of the Oriole way, which, uh, as I think you said before, was the correct way to play to play baseball. Um, how important was Paul Richards to uh, to getting the Orioles' foundation established? He probably is the most important guy that I ever dealt with in baseball. Uh, he worked us on fundamentals just every day, hour upon hour upon hour. And, of course, when you're going through that, you get tired of it, and you're saying, what in the world is this? But after looking back on your career, uh, you know, when that ball was hit to the right side, you knew – you didn't even think you were gone. You you covered first base, and and the, the, and when a ball got hit to the outfield, you were backing up bases. It just became, it it, it was automatic. You you didn't even have to think about it. You were already on your way, and uh, and he he like I say, I don't think anybody worked any harder at fundamentals than Paul Richards did. Yeah, he was important. Uh, Katie, any questions from the audience, please? Sure. Um, if any of the people who are unmuted right now, um, Nadine or Ray or Bob Newton, any questions? Not yet. Okay. I have, Katie, <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Go ahead, Ed. Hi. Um, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Jack, uh, first off, Jack, when you um, – I think I understood from watching the video that I don't think you felt undue pressure facing um, facing Maris as he's you know pushing toward uh, tying tying or breaking Ruth's record. You kind of considered it a a um, a uh, I guess a challenge. You 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 were named the pitcher and you had a job to do. If I'm uh, I think if I recall that correctly. Um, that did you face him after he hit that home run? Did you happen to face him um, at one any more in in that in that game? You mean in in, a, in another game? No, in in that same game. Oh, in that same? No, huh? No, I was I was I think that he hit the home run he hit was like in the seventh inning, wasn't it? Okay, and now it, I, and they ended up scoring the the winning run, I think, in the bottom of the ninth. Yeah. And I, uh, I noticed in the next day that um, when I just looked just looked at the box score, Steve Barber was the starting pitcher, and then Dick Hall fouled at them, and New Orleans won that game three to two. But Maris wasn't in the in the lineup at all. Was that? Uh, do you have any recollection? Like, why is it because Steve Barber was left-handed? He was left-handed, or because maybe they felt he needed some some uh, you know a day off after? I have no. I, <laughs> I have no idea, but I know I know darn well Steve Barber was tough on left handers and right handers. Mm -hmm. He had some stuff. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. Next question. Sure, Wally, you go ahead. Um, sure, and um, if this is controversial or negative, I don't want it to be negative. I don't want the conversation to go negative, but. Um, Jack, I just remember being a, like Mike, just a rabid fan. And I remember the Kitty Corps being the, the great hope for the next decade. Um, and, you know, people around town uh, threw uh, Harry Bikin, um under the bus because uh, he, he brushed the arms too hard and pushed them too hard. You mentioned in your prior uh, thing about uh, the strength of your arm, but um, is there any validity to uh, that criticism? Harry, Harry was, uh, he was our uh, pitching coach, but he worked so closely with Paul Richards. When you're down there uh, working in the bullpen, uh, both Richards and Burkeen were down there. So uh, Harry, Harry pretty much followed what Richards wanted. 
so I, I, I can't fault Harry in, in any way. Uh, you know, it was, it was done the way, the way Richard wanted it. Got it. If, if I could jump into that, uh, I, I might, uh, I, and naturally back up Jack, because there's no question that, that Paul Richards was the pitching guru in that era. But Harry stayed around a long time. And when Harry actually, if you want to put it that way, got thrown under the bus was really in 67. And it, and it fell into the fact that in, in, in the 66, 67 era, Palmer, uh, Barber, Bolly Bunker, uh, all guys, all guys that can't, had come down with bad arms uh, along the way. And prior to that, I mean, I think the one that, that Paul took some heat about was, was Jerry Walker. But I, I think Harry, Harry more or less, uh, if you want to say, got under the bus. Uh, it was long after Richards was there when he actually was more under under Bauer. He was a lot had a lot more to do with the pitchers than he did under Paul. Okay, I did. I had no. I knew I had no knowledge of that. So um, let me ask a question. Uh, since we're talking about uh, managers and coaches. Um, Jack, you you played under Paul Richards, and you played under Casey Stengel, two pretty prominent guys. Um, one better than the other to you, or, or equal, or well, the difference between the two? Can you talk about that? Uh, Casey, uh, it, it's tough to describe Casey. He was, I uh, mean. <laughs> The main thing I ever wanted when I was on a club uh, from a manager was to give me the ball every four days. Uh, that, 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 that's what I really wanted. And uh, Casey gave me the ball every four days. And that's what I appreciated more about Casey than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, Richards, uh, I didn't have the ball every four days. Uh, but I pitched a lot out of the bullpen at the time, too. And then I was like a spot starter. Uh, and uh, towards the end of the season, I did get in the rotation, though. Uh, that, that's, that's all I wanted to do. And in fact, uh, <laughs> it's a lot different from, uh, from today. When, I, when we finished the seasons there in, in 60, uh, I went off to, down to Puerto Rico and, and pitched another uh, 120, 130 innings in winter ball. And wow. came back and, and 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 started right into the the sixty one season, and for the next year I did it. I did it two years in a row, going down there. Well, you know, I, all told, I was I was pitching well over, you know, probably three twenty to three fifty innings a year, for for those uh, two and a half years. So you uh, know, when we uh, when we did our interview a couple of weeks ago, I didn't ask you, but I'll ask you now. Um, you were a hard thrower. You threw a lot of innings. Did you ever have any arm problems? I, you know, a funny thing after a, the, the winter ball session that I had, and and what I guess that would be sixty three. I didn't go to winter ball. That was sixty two was my last year, I think, in winter ball. And after spending the winter not using my arm, I went down to spring training, and boom, my my right shoulder kind of went on me and I spent the first 30 days on the disabled list which is the only wow. time in my career I was ever on the disabled list wow. and it, that, I mean that that's just ridiculous that all of a sudden you get to rest your arm and go down and I could not get my arm uh, uh, going my, my right shoulder and finally I got some cortisone shots and and all the doctor's orders and then Thirty days later, I was I was back on the on the staff. Well, uh, uh, one difference uh, from your era to today's pitchers, uh, who Tommy John surgery is just like it's it's a prerequisite for getting on with your career, you know. Well, the the Tommy John surgery is is more I think in the elbow area than the right. shoulder area, and uh, I mean everybody. <laughs> You, every pitcher you talked to back in my day uh, was you had you had little pains in your in your elbow, and it's just something that you pitched through. 
And uh, normally after you get good and loose and everything, then the pain went away. Hmm. Uh, but just sitting at the table and reaching over for a, a salt shaker every once in a while, it would grab you, <laughs> the, the elbow. So you, you found a, a different way of going after that salt shaker. <laughs> Adam, do, uh, uh, do you, you know, uh, with the the proclivity of, of pitchers, today's pitchers getting hurt so frequently, um, what are your feelings about that? They 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 obviously train differently than back in Jack's day. Uh, there's a, a, more weights involved. I mean, these guys are, are much more uh, muscled. Than, weight, what, what do you think? Well, you know, I mean, obviously, I, I'm sure that, that Jack and I are pretty much in the same corner here. I mean, and, and I did, uh, I did grow up listening to George Bamberger a lot. And George's big theory was. Lost him. Oh. We lost, we lost him, lost him. Okay. Um, while we try and get Jim back, uh, Katie, do you have any other questions from our audience? I think, I mean, Jack, you, 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 certainly, you, you certainly had to know that the third time through the lineup was going to be a little tougher than the first time or two. Uh, today, third time through the lineup is like all, almost automatic. They don't, they're, some of these pitchers, I mean, Jacob deGrom, I've done a lot of, I've done a, a lot of research on, on, his, on his career, and he almost, he, he has seen a lineup three complete times maybe only a handful of times his whole career. Wow. Uh, well, I just don't know. I don't know how you get legitimate statistics on something like that unless somebody does it a number of times. I mean, I, it makes well, sense. Yeah, I, I'd be curious to see what Jack thinks about that. Yeah. The, the, think, the, way, I, the way I feel about it is, is you know, when, when I was pitching a ball game, of course, when you handed the ball, I expected to go nine innings or, or even longer. I've pitched as much as 13 innings. But it seemed like when it got towards the end of the game, I really I, I felt even stronger, and, and I had a, a, an idea of how I had pitched to the, these hitters. Uh, you don't pitch to them absolutely the same way. I mean, certain hitters you would pitch one way with men on base and another way without men on base. And... Uh, but uh, I, I almost felt uh, there were times when I've pitched nine innings, and if it was the first game of doubleheader, I felt like I could go out and start the next game. I mean, uh, absolutely was not tired. Uh, we did the biggest thing, I think, the change in the pitching today and back when we did. We did a lot of throwing between starts. Uh, not, well, even... Yeah, the day after you pitched, you went out and you did a little long toss in the outfield. The second day, you had a bullpen section. The third day, you threw a little bit more in the outfield. And, and the fourth day, you went out and pitched. Well, and we absolutely, we were, you could not pick up a weight. There was no, no such thing as weights around any clubhouse. Uh, yeah, I, I would be... <laughs> Yeah, I, I would have a tough time uh, dealing if I were a pitching coach in baseball today. And, and these guys are all in the weight rooms. Uh, I think that their, their, their muscles are getting so tight using those, those weights that uh, you do anything just off kilter a little bit and something's going to snap. And, and we just absolutely were, we were told, don't you dare do any kind of weightlifting. How about swimming, Jack? Were you told also not to swim? No, no, okay. never told not to swim. I had heard that. I had also heard that. Uh, he, he signed a contract. Jack Fisher. No, I was never but told not to swim. swim I didn't do a lot of swimming. As a kid <laughs> growing up, I did. Right. But uh, I, when I was in baseball, it, obviously in the summertime, you don't have that much time to do. Right, exactly, yeah. Swim. So, uh uh, Jim Eneman, 1961, Roger Maris is is uh, bearing down on on Ruth's record. Um, I was at the 154th game with my father when Pappas gave up number 59, and I remember the tension 
in the uh, the crowd that night with all the white handkerchiefs blowing and all that stuff. But, uh, wh you know, that that whole scenario, and then when Jack gives up number 60, um, you're covering it. What, do, what, do, what, were, what are your memories of that? Well, I, I was covering that series in Baltimore. I mean, that was a, a, a five-game series, as I recall. And actually, that was my, my only assignment. That whole series was basically just to track Maris, just to, to follow him pretty much. And, and the one thing that I remember, and I, Jack would probably be able to, could, well, he to a degree, he could understand it. But, you know, there was a lot of fuss made about about the one th about the 54, 154-game schedule and the attention that it got. But in reality, there really wasn't that many people there as far as the, the, the journalistic part of it was concerned. The clubhouse was, was really, you know, not – not that uh, that crowded. It wasn't hard to to move around, and and uh, and I mean, and Jack certainly remembers. I mean, when he when he did hit sixty in Yankee Stadium, there wasn't as many people in the game that day as there was in in, in the games in Baltimore. I mean, so it, it was kind of bizarre, really, to me. Uh, you know, trying to even looking back on it today, with when you look and consider that that Maris's record lasted longer than Roos did, and uh, you know, it just, um, I don't know. I, I have a sometimes tough time putting a lot of it in perspective, maybe because I was so young at the time. I mean, it was a big thing to me uh, at, at the time. Yeah, I, I wonder if, if uh, something that Jack said during our previous interview, that uh, um, it was Maris chasing Ruth and not Mantle. And I wonder if Mantle had been, if the if the roles had been reversed and Mantle was chasing him, if if there might have been more attention and larger crowds, uh, you know, uh, attending those ball games. Because you're right, there, there weren't that many people uh, in Baltimore. I think there maybe uh, there were 21,000 on the 154 game night when Pappas gave up home run number 59. Um, I, Jack, I, I don't remember. I don't. I can't recall how many were at Yankee Stadium for number sixty, but it was not a huge crowd, was it? It was a few more than that. I think I looked at that. I think it was like twenty three thousand. I'm not. Yeah. Okay. What in Baltimore? No, in New York. I, I think York. I, okay. I, I thought it was more in Baltimore, but but evidently I miss. I don't remember the crowd in Baltimore the way it actually was. I thought it was yeah. bigger than. That. Yeah, but but twenty three thousand in New York is not a big number, and so I don't know. Maybe the man. Yeah, thing especially is, especially in a pennant race. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, well, yeah. Jack, I mean, Jack could identify to that, and also to to the other home run that everybody talks about a lot of times. You know, Ted Ted Williams' last game in Boston is less than eleven thousand people. I mean, it just it kind of magnifies the difference in the way things are today um you know the impact of obviously television and and so forth i mean the magnitude of the, the game is uh obviously i mean it's you know we're constantly complaining about a lot of things but but um uh, i mean for a city uh, like yeah. that, you know and i was at k-line's last game in detroit and there was four thousand people there and that was <laughs> 74 so oh, you know awesome. Well, I, I can say the one in the, the one in Boston, probably the weather had as much to do with, uh, as anything because it was it was a cold, miserable day in 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 uh, in Boston when he hit the the home run his last time at bat, yeah. and uh, so I think the weather probably had as much probably, to do yeah. with it. Even though Ted had had uh, come out and and said that that was going to be his last game. Right. Yeah, because he he's got it prior to the game. Right. They ended the season in in New York, and he wasn't. He didn't go. Right. He didn't make the trip. And you know the weather was also a factor in that. That, if I'm not mistaken, there was a hurricane either before, you know, around the time that uh, the the series in Baltimore. There was there was a there was a big right. weather issue going. There was a yeah yeah yeah. So as that may have impacted, but you know, Baltimore fans always showed up for uh, a, a New York series. And with their white handkerchiefs and all that stuff, and it was that oh, was yeah. good. Um, but right, uh, we got about time for one more question, Sean. You want to go ahead? Yeah. Any last uh, any 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 uh, last questions from the audience? Yeah. 
Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Jack and Jim, uh, for doing this program. It's been it's been fun. Uh, my question is uh, to you, Jack, because you know tonight between the program and now we've talked about Ted Williams and Star Joel and Hank Aaron and Roger Maris. Um, but when I also think of that era, I think of the pitching folks, people like Jim Palmer and Sandy Koufax, who, in your opinion, were some of the best pitchers of your era, some of your contemporaries? Well, number one uh, of the p- best pitchers I saw, I always rank him Sandy Koufax as number one, because uh, every time he towed the rubber, you, you had a chance to see a no-hitter. I mean, that, that's the way I felt about him. Uh, and, and I've gotten to be a pretty good friend. In fact, Sandy doesn't, in the summertime, he lives up near me, and we get to play golf every once in a while together. And So we've gotten to be pretty good friends. Uh, number two, I think the guy that uh, probably pitched as well for about six or seven innings as anybody you want to see was Whitey Ford. He was he was just tremendous. Uh, and... and the year I spent with Juan Marichal uh, out in San Francisco, he he won twenty uh, some ball games that year, and and it seemed like he hardly ever broke a sweat. I mean, he had such uncanny control and change of speeds, and uh, and if he wanted to, he could throw the ball hard, but he always hit spots. Uh, those probably are the top. Oh, and and also, uh, I'd have to throw Seaver in there for the the uh, year that I I really got to see him uh, blossom. He 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 just uh, he was a grinder. I, I loved loved to watch him pitch. So they they I think were the top four pitchers I saw. Of course, now I'm leaving out guys like Gibson, and, uh, which is tough to do. You're not kidding. You're not kidding. So that's an impressive group. Okay. Um, we've come to about the uh, end, the end of our, our half hour discussion, and uh, I want to thank our guys Jim Henneman and uh, Jack Fisher for coming on, um, and, and Jack for a great inter- interview that we did a couple of weeks ago talking about the historic moments that you uh, experienced in Major League Baseball history. So um, um, with that, I'm going to sign off and turn it over to our our executive director, Sean Hearn. This is the conclusion of our three nights of uh, uh, birthday bash programming. Sean, it's all you. Thank you, Mike. And actually, I want to especially thank Mike and Katie for putting all this together. Um, over the past few weeks, it's been a lot of hard work. And as always, they've done a, a stellar job. And, um, you know, I want to thank all the people who have been participating each night, um, watching the programs and asking questions. And of course, I want to thank our sponsors, the Jack Lynch Law Group, Zola, Lennett and Fink Group at Morgan Stanley, Fran Soisman, Bob and uh, Elaine Pevenstein, Wolf Security, First Floor Graphics, Alisana Collective, Mission Barbecue, there's a whole lot of folks behind the scenes that make these kind of things happen. And, and without them, they just wouldn't happen. So um, thank you. Thank you all for, for tuning in. And I hope you watch some of the programs again and share them with your friends. And, um, and be sure as we come to this end of COVID to come down and see our new exhibit, uh, The Making of a Legend. It's gonna be a, a spectacular addition to the museum. And as always, um, fingers crossed, um, we hope to see you at our opening day party um, as soon as we know when that's going to be. So thank you for tuning in and thank you for being the friends and sponsors and patrons of the Babe Ruth Birthplace and Museum.